Welcome back to the summer school. Today's session is about machine learning, directly followed by a virtual tour through ECMWF. And I'm very pleased that we have a very competent chair, Peter Duben from ECMWF, who will talk about the machine learning and a lot of activities that's going on at ECMWF. Peter, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Julian. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let's see how competent I am in my topic here. Um, I am going to talk about machine learning for weather and climate predictions. Um, yeah, I'm Peter. I'm working at um, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, and you will hear much, much more about this in the well um, bef until lunch, I guess. Um, we have this kind of rather strange acronym ECMWF that I'm going to use whenever I'm going to talk about this center. Um, at this center, I'm a Royal, Royal Society University Research Fellow, which means that I am um, kind of well free to do a, a lot of research. And also, I'm the coordinator for machine learning and AI activities. And that's kind of the reason why I'm giving this um, talk here. And I guess um, I'm also involved in the Easy Waste project, which is kind of um, behind the summer school. So um, there's also another link to um, to the summer school here as well. So I'm also kind of looking a lot into very high resolution simulations. And in particular, also um, regarding reduced numerical position and the use of, for example, single position forecasts. So throughout, I'm going to talk about machine learning. And um, throughout this talk, please, 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 whenever you have questions, um, feel free to interrupt. Um, I, I do realize that this is not as easy in a virtual talk as it is um, if you basically are on site and you kind of can look in in, uh, into each other, other's eyes, but please, um, whenever you have questions, um, you will um, need to interrupt me, and I will also try to ask questions. And let's see how far this, how how well this goes, um, given that this is virtual. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the outline, and just uh, before I go on, Julian, can everyone hear me well? Is everything fine with the technique? Because I can't see Blackboard at the moment; I only see my screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about um, the, the definition of machine learning first and then give you a, a quick introduction what we mean in principle by machine learning. Um, then I'm going to kind of try to answer the question how we can um, use machine learning to improve weather and climate modeling. Um, then I will go basically into a couple of examples for the use of machine learning in weather and climate predictions. And I do realize that those slides are going to quite, be quite technical. So again, if you have any questions, please interrupt. We have enough time. If we don't make it to the end of the presentation, that's no problem at, at all. Um, so the most important part is that you understand what I'm saying. So please interrupt whenever you think um, you want to get more information. And then um, I'm briefly going to touch on machine learning and high performance computing for two reasons. The, the, the main reason is because um, the summer school is also about high performance computing. So we should talk about this here as well, I guess. But also, really, um, machine learning and high-performance computing are um, very much linked to each other. So it, um, you can't really look into the one without the other. And finally, I'm going to discuss briefly challenges for machine learning and how, um, well, you, for example, could um, try to kind of uh, tackle those challenges in the future. <clears throat> and um, you can see my email on the bottom left, and you can also see my Twitter link. Um, so Please feel free to con contact me whenever um, you feel like it, if you have questions um, to the slides, but also if, if you want to get more information or so, um, please let me know. Julian can, can also kind of provide my contact details if you want. Okay, um, machine learning. Let's start with a couple of definitions because um, they are often a bit interlinked and not quite separated from each other. So um, there's one class of things, which is so-called artificial intelligence. And um, what is it? It's called AI often. And the de definition of Wikipedia is basically that artificial intelligence is intelligence demonstrated by machines in contrast to the natural intelligence displaced by humans. Um, what does it mean? If you, for example, build a self-driving car and the self-driving car is kind of realizing that there's a cyclist um, crossing the road in front of it and the self-driving driving car would stop because of the cyclist and um, without any human interfering, it's basically taking a lot of decisions that, that typically a human would do. And that would basically um, was thought about only humans could do um, maybe like 15 years ago. So that's kind of artificial intelligence. So the capability of machines to make decisions that typically are done by humans. Then there's a subclass of um, artificial intelligence, which is called machine learning. 
And what this is, is basically, it's a scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform a specific task without using explicit instructions. That's kind of a bit weird definition, but basically this means um, that I've taught a machine to detect a cyclist um, from other things that are maybe not so important to the ra as rain um, by only by a data-driven task. So I haven't really told them um, told the machine that it should look out for kind of two small wheels or something like this to detect the cyclist, but I really have only given it data and the and the the algorithm basically learned itself how to distinguish between a cyclist and rain. And then there's another subclass which is deep learning. So that's kind of now um, a subclass within machine learning. And this is a kind of a very specific tool. It's kind of a, it's a part of a broad family of machine learning methods based on artificial neural networks. And I'm going to talk about artificial neural network in a minute. But basically, it's a specific technique that we are using to, for example, detect a cyclist in a picture. So this is kind of now a very specific thing. There's someone. Say a question. No, just a technical hiccup. That's OK. Um, so what is an artificial neural network and what is kind of deep learning in particular? And this is kind of a slide that should give you like one example of machine learning um, algorithms that I used. So as you all know, um, the human brain is working with, with a lot of neurons and the neurons are interconnected. And somehow by changing the connectivity between the neurons, we are learning. And um, a neural network is like an artificial neural network is now following the same concept. So you have input um, data at the, the left and you have output data on the right. And then you have so-called hidden layer in the middle where you have a lot of neurons that are interconnected to each other. And um, you basically now um, give this new network a lot of different input and output pairs, so an enormous amount of data. And then you, you basically try to map from the input data to the output data given those um, given the data set that you have. And you do this by adjusting those weights um, for each neuron. And once you've done this, once you basically have learned um, what this underlying system is doing, you can actually predict uh, um, unseen up, um, inputs. Uh, sorry, you can predict outputs from unseen inputs that you haven't, that you don't know before. So you can actually try to mimic what the system is doing um, just by learning from the data. How is this kind of data learning doing? I decided not to present you a lot of mathematical equations, how this is working in principle. However, um, I can basically tell you that um, the information for each neuron is coming from 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 a, sp um, a number of neurons on the left side in this case where you have a feed forward network and then you basically um, you sum up this information and then you put an activation function into place and this activation function can be a lot of different um, mathematical functions in principle but basically it's really that you adjust um, the weights of the connectivity from one neuron to the next and the question is now how can you actually how do you know for example how to adjust a specific weight of a specific connection and here um, there has been like um, like a mathematical revolution, if you want, by de uh, developing something which is called the back propagation algorithm. So this is basically a mathematical way to figure out um, if you kind of make a prediction from inputs to outputs and they're not quite right to figure out what weight actually need to be changed um, or how, how by how much a specific weight um, in the network needs to be changed in principle. So. The key here really is um, that you can feed this neural network whatever you want. So you can use whatever input data you want and you get what um, you can have whatever output data you want. It's just basically the fact that you need to have input output data and you need to also give the network like um, a notion of what is good or bad. So you need to give it basically, you need to tell it, for example, that you should optimize for the difference in the output level um, or that you should basically um, well, you, you need to give it like a notion of, of when it's actually performing well and when it's performing badly. But otherwise, you don't need to give it anything. You don't need any kind of physical interpretation of what you're doing. Um, and therefore, you kind of learn everything as a black box, really. Um, so you, you don't always know what the network is doing in principle. One important thing here is, um, which kind of separates approaches from um, neural networks and deep neural networks from from more similar, more simple machine learning algorithms like I don't know linear regression or something like this. The, um, the important difference is basically that for a deep neural network, you can increase complexity to whatever level of complexity you want. So, in principle, the more data that you have, the better the solution is going to be. 
Um, because the more data you have, the more complex you can make the net network structure that you're working with. And it would be very easy, for example, to just um, introduce more hidden layer into this structure here. And we would talk about a deeper neural network. Or um, that you basically um, also in kind of in increase the complexity in terms of um, having more neurons per, per layer and so on and so forth. So you can kind of build all sorts of very complex architectures. And the interesting bit here really is um, that there's no limit. So if you have gigabytes um, of data, you can work with a certain um, um, complexity of the network. But if you have terabytes, you can increase complexity and the solution is also going to get better um, if you can afford to train from this data. And there's one caveat to it, which is basically um, that this of the network should fit to the data. So if I have, for example, gigabytes of data, but I'm applying an enormous amount of like a, a, a neural network, which is extremely complex, um, I, I'm, I'm running into a problem. Does anyone of you know what the problem is? I think there's something going on here. Overfitting, yes. Um, I don't know where I read it, but yeah, here we go. So that's exactly right. The problem is overfitting. Um, there has been, has been another question that I'm going to come back in a minute. Um, so what's basically happening is um, that your neural network is able to represent the data set extremely well um, and actually too well, which means that it can um, really represent. Um, the, I mean, a neural network can be interpreted to some extent as being a bit of a lookup table. <clears throat> so the idea is that you could have um, built a, a good lookup table that would kind of always look into the data sets and um, extract information about similar states and then basically learn um, how to, well, the, to make a prediction from this, this lookup table into the future and to kind of find um, find a solution for any any point in the space of the input parameters. However, if you have a very, very um, network, it will basically only learn exactly to represent those points in the inputs, but it will not really be able to interpolate between the different data points anymore because it's too fine grained in the resolution if you want. And this basically means um, that if you have um, not enough data, but a too complex network structure, you will be overfitting and you will only be able to represent exactly those points in the input data set, but not really be able to interpolate between those points. Um, more questions coming in as far as I understand. Um, so the first one is, is there a case where input and output are the same variable or data? Uh, yes, there is. So you can, um, an example here would basically be if you had um, a system, for example, um, a temperature evaluation, evaluation uh, a temperature time series over reading. In principle, you could also make a prediction. So you can just, um, well, um, predict the next temperature value for tomorrow, or um, on the, and the temperature value in the day after, and so on and so forth. You can you can make a time series. You can actually make iterative networks that use the the output layer of the last step as input layer for the next step. So that's possible. Um, Luciana um, asked, I cannot think of a case with input and output being the same. Do you have something specific in mind? Oh, yes. I, I, I just tried to explain this. Um, if, you, if this wasn't clear, please let me know. There's someone talking. Uh, uh, it's just me, Peter. Uh, usually it's sometimes fine. we just uh, talk in the chat with each other, kind of. So someone puts okay. and then I try to answer the question, and then Nicola can come back to try to talk to. So uh, we may you may continue your presentation, and maybe in half an hour, and then you can stop and see if there is uh, if there are some unanswered questions. So it's up to you, but I I prefer if the question I, I, we can also discuss them in the group, I guess. But anyway, yeah, post your okay. questions, and I can take them if if that makes sense or not. Okay, it's up to you too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, univariate time series, um, as proposed by Nicolo, is a good example where you could, in principle, make predictions as well. OK, I'll, I'm going to t continue from here. Um, one more thing is um, that right now, as I said, they are very flexible, those neural networks. And therefore, the number of applications really increased every day. And you will, I'm sure you'll have heard about image recognition applications or speech recognition or healthcare applications, gaming, finance, whatever. Where people use those rather complex machine learning tools to do things um, that where we were quite sure that a machine couldn't do this before. Like, for example, um, beating a human in playing Go or something like this. And the question now is, uh, how does this transfer to weather? So how how are we actually um, 
how does this kind of this complexity, well, this these, this new set of tools, how does it actually, um, what, what what is the difference that it makes to, to weather and climate predictions? And before going on with this question, I just have one other thing that I wanted to present, which is decisions, which is kind of another subclass of machine learning. What's happening here is basically, I mean, you, you all, guy, all of you know decision trees in principle. So you basically start from something and then you make a, um, a separation between different, different cases. For example, in this case, a cloud fraction, which is larger than 75%. And then you go down and you have different cases. For example, total precipitation being less than two millimeters or more and so on and so forth. And then you look into surface winds and so. So this is kind of really a, a decision tree structure. And um, this specific example is actually a decision tree which is used at ESN WF um, in, a, in a tool called EC, um, EC Point. And I'm going to talk about this later on a slide. But I just want to give you the, the concept here um, because it's also like a very, very important tool of machine learning. So decision fork, decisions fork in tree structures until predictions um, is made is kind of the, the, the concept of the um, decision tree as such. And then there are basically um, tools such as random forest where you basically um, you, you train a multiple multitude of decision trees and then you kind of um, make you, you you follow the tree structures and you get like different um, suggestions from the trees. And then you can, for example, take the mean prediction or you can also take the value that most of the trees are, um, are predicting. So you can really kind of make a bit of a, a more complex lookup table with different solutions. And then you know, uh, get an impression of um, <clears throat> what what is the most likely scenario and what the uncertainty is. So decision trees are often fast and accurate um, and they're able to conserve some of the properties of the system. So I told you before about the neural networks, for example, that you don't really know what the network is doing. So to build a system there that would, for example, um, conserve um, mass in a fluid dynamic application is quite difficult because we don't really, um, we can't tell the neural network easily um, what the conservation property that we want to have is. Whereas in a decision tree, since it's kind of really more linked like to individual decisions where you know what you're doing, and you also kind of compare it against the uh, um, existing well, cases in the past, you can actually more, much more easily conserve properties. However, um, in terms of the high performance computing component of this, um, the problem here is that those decision trees basically require a lot of information and therefore they require a lot of memory in the computing system. So therefore they are often quite clunky if you want to use them in the high performance computing system. Okay. Um, so, one more general overview slide about machine learning. Um, I, so I just now presented you two different versions of machine learning. One is deep learning uh, with, with neural networks. The other one is decision trees, but there are many, many more. And actually it's kind of a bit unclear what to count into machine learning nowadays. You can also um, argue to some extent that a simple linear regression would be already machine learning. And you can also argue that, for example, a principal component analysis like you do in, in climate science and EUF analysis and something like this would also be machine learning. So it's not that there's a clear cut. And you can also argue um, that a lot of those those tools have been used already um, before, but we just haven't named them machine learning. However, there are two big families that I just want to touch upon. And this is a, a figure that I kind of just um, shamelessly copied from the internet. So you have um, the classical machine learning here, and this can be separated into two, two families. One of them is supervised and the other one is unsupervised learning. And what's happening here is basically um, the examples that I've just shown you are supervised learning. So what I have is an, an input and an output, and I kind of want to train a machine learning tool to, to solve a specific, um, to optimize for a specific um, function, if you want. So I basically tell, I, I, I give the, the problem on what I call a labeled data set. So I basically um, I, I tell them exactly what to learn and what to train for. And there are, in the supervised learning category, there are basically two, two more subcategories, um, which is basically one of them is a classification problem. So it could, for example, be um, I give you 1,000 pictures and um, the machine learning tool should figure out in which of those is a cat. So it will basically be yes or no question. It wouldn't be um, in, like, a, like a continuous answer. It would be more like um, divide, like in this, this example here, divide the color of socks, uh, divide, divide the socks by color. So it's either red or green, and it's not like um, two quarter red and one uh, one quarter green or something like this. Um, the other thing is the regression, and there we basically um, really are talking about um, a tool that is trying to kind of get a specific value, which can be continuous. For example, um, divides the ties by length. So it's kind of more about a um, really like a like a continuous um, value that you are searching for. 
And now on the unsupervised learning, what's happening here is um, that you basically don't give it labeled data set. You just give it an enormous amount of pictures, for example. And then you use machine learning to cluster and to kind of identify differences between those pictures. So you can um, basically give it, I don't know, a million pictures. And then um, the machine learning algorithm will try to un understand that there are different classes of pictures. And once it has understood this, it will actually be able to um, to tell you, like, um, okay, I've, in your million pictures, I have found 100 different classes. And then you, you look into a, a specific class and you realize, oh, this class is actually representing cats. And class number five is actually representing cars, for example. So it's kind of much more sophisticated to some extent. It's much more natural to kind of learn from unsupervised data, but it's also much, much more difficult. And that's the reason why I, I think I'm only going to show you supervised learning applications in this um, in this presentation when I go to specific examples. Um, for unsupervised learning, you could, for example, assume that, the, as I said, the principal component analysis, EOF analysis, um, to kind of identify weather regimes, for example, could already be um, assumed to be unsupervised learning because they basically give it data and the system would kind of um, figure out the modes. So here the subclasses are clustering algorithms. Um, for example, to divide uh, a certain input data set into um, similarities. You can do associ association and also you can do dimensionality reduction by trying to understand um, the most <clears throat> the most prominent modes, for example. Okay, um, I'm going to look at the chat again. Let's see. In which sense a, a lot of memory is required for decision trees? Yeah, this is um, basically um, if you have... Um, you just need a lot of memory. You need to store a lot of information in those decision trees, right? To the application of decision tree to just kind of go down the tree structure is very simple, but you need a lot of data if you kind of want to store a lot of options for the trees. So that's the reason um, why this requires a lot of memory. So the, most, the, the better you want to be in your decision trees, um, the more memory you will actually need. Okay. Um, so. Where's the sudden hype about machine learning coming from? Um, that's the next question. So as I said before, deep learning is um, kind of fairly new still. I mean, it's a couple of years in there, but but it's still it's a bit of a new kid on the block in particular towards applications like weather and climate. Um, but machine learning has been used for weather predictions for many, many years. Um, so the, a lot of the people, uh, there are many, many papers out there um, where the authors haven't really um, identified their work as machine learning when they wrote it, um, but it basically would, would would fit into this category um, category um, nowadays. However, machine learning is not a niche application anymore, and um, everyone seems to be talking about machine learning. I certainly do. And um, the reason the reasons um, for this is there are several. One of them is basically because of the explosion of supercomputing performance and data availability. So if you just look into the the data that has been available um, for science in the last, well, the increase of the data, it's just amazing. It's an explosion of the, the data that, that is there. And also, um, we are, nowadays, we have much, much faster supercomputers than we had 20 years ago. So which means we have more data and more computing capacity. And this means that we can now basically tackle way more complex problems with our machine learning algorithms. Our neural networks can be extremely complex with millions of trainable um, degrees of freedoms. Um, if you have, um, and, and the data is also available to train those very complex networks. It's also clear that there have been a lot of success stories. Um, so people nowadays start to work with machine learning tools in their daily life. And um, this hasn't necessarily been the case like 20 years ago. Um, so now, nowadays, if I have to solve a capture to kind of, um, when, when typing in a password or something like this, I'm often failing and I kind of, uh, realize that now machine learning algorithms are probably more competent in doing these things than I do. But also there are these famous examples of playing Go and beating humans and Jeopardy and whatever, translating text, um, where really machine learning um, is visible and very much to the public. Um, it's also true that machine learning has benefited a lot from a ve from very powerful software tools that are around. Um, so there, I'll just give three examples here, but there are even more. And those tools are really amazing. So if you know anything about Python and you have a lot of data um, and you kind of le have learned how to read the data into Python and how to kind of uh, learn the, the ABC of um, how to apply machine learning tools, you can really, as a non-machine learner, um, develop very complex machine learning structures within Python code by using, I don't know, 100 lines of code or something like this. So 
those libraries are really very, very powerful. They also link very much into HPC systems. So once you have basically um, described a problem in, 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 a, in a code like TensorFlow, you will be able to port it to almost every hardware because basically TensorFlow can run very efficiently on almost every hardware because companies like Google are taking care of this. So the software tools that are available I, are very important for machine learning because it's really, really easy for non-experts to get started here. This is another thing that I wanted to say. Um, I'm not going to give you great, easy examples to start with machine learning because I, I know that um, if you just type into Google and um, machine learning tutorials, you will probably get a number of options and it would be probably much easier to kind of follow them just by your own speed to kind of really learn how the um, how to very, very uh, to kind of to train very simple um, neural networks, for example. So I think there's a lot of um, well knowledge around in the system, and I only have one hour to talk about this, so I'm kind of focusing more on what you can do with machine learning than how to do it in principle. But please let me know if you have any questions regarding this um, after the talk. Another point is um, that it has been a breathtaking developments in the design of new machine learning tools. So nowadays we're talking about something like 100 new papers coming out on machine learning every day. And this means that um, like 10 years ago, it was quite difficult to, well, we, we, you, you only had a couple of options actually to build very different architectures for neural networks. And nowadays you have um, too many options to be able to test them. So we have really a lot of um, knowledge nowadays how to kind of build more sophisticated tools um, that are kind of really customized more towards your needs. And last but not least, artificial intelligence is a trillion dollar market. Um, this means that there is a lot of technical development, but this also means really um, that a lot of smart people who are now kind of leaving university are going to look into exactly this market because um, there's a lot to gain and a lot of um, money to be made. Um, and this really helps the community to kind of bring forward machine learning in principle. Just one example, for example, if you compare the trillion dollar market of machine learning with the uh, multi-billion market of high performance computing in general, you will also see that, um, and then keep in mind that high performance computing is important for machine learning, you will um, also see that, mach that machine learning has an enormous impact on high performance computing right at the moment, because basically just the orders of magnitude differences in, in the market value. Okay, so what I think you should get from the slide is basically um, that machine learning can learn the behavior of extremely complex um, systems if enough data is available. So, and I think there were more questions here. Um, sometimes I hear people not willing to simple statistics like regression as machine learning. Is this maybe a matter of opinion? Should machine learning refer more strictly to deep learning? So I'm, so Julian said, um, it's a per regression can be used. Yeah, yeah, deep learning subclass of machine. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, so it's 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 all a bit mixed up. Really. I would I would basically say regression is also machine learning, but other people would disagree. I don't think I don't think there's a point really to argue too much about these kind of things. But it's it's good to keep in mind that different people have different opinions about these things. So now coming back to weather. Um, and climate, because that's what we're talking about here mainly. Um, so why would machine learning help in weather predictions? And the first question I want to ask you guys is actually, um, why is it so difficult to predict weather and climate? So what's what's making a weather prediction such a difficult task and why can't you trust a 10-day weather forecast? Um, so what, what, is, what is the reason why these things are so complicated? Please let me know. You can either write in the chat or you can, you can uh, switch on your mic. Yes, two big good points. So the first one is chaotic system, and the other one is and the number of features. Large number of interconnections also. Lots of variables, bad initial conditions, here we go. Um, all, all very, very well lit and good points. So basically, um, I'm going to present you my, my personal um, line here, but you will see basically all the points that you just raised in there. So first of all, um, the Earth is quite big. So you see here a picture of the Earth from one of the Apollo missions, and um, it's just a huge system, right? Which basically means um, if we want to represent this system in a model and kind of run a weather forecast or climate simulation, even if you kind of run it on the fastest supercomputers in the world, you will only have a limited resolution of your model simulations. Um, 
Basically, this means that if you go to something like a 10 kilometer resolution in your forecast simulation, which you typically work with at least in WF nowadays, um, then you will not be able to resolve something like an individual cloud. Um, but you, we all know that individual clouds that are above you and raining are, are quite important for you. So it's, it's just that basically um, a lot of the processes that are important cannot be represented. The second point is um, the system is chaotic which makes it difficult to predict the future. So if you, for example, think about atmosphere and ocean, they are chaotic fluids. So um, if you have in, um, problems in the initial conditions that you will have, no question, then those errors that are coming from the initial conditions would grow exponentially, even if you had um, a perfect model system in principle. Another point is um, that there are also a lot of different model components in here, right? You have atmosphere, you have ocean, you have land surface, you have topography, you have cloud physics, you have cloud chemistry, you have um, you have ice um, on land, you have ice in the ocean, and so on and so forth. So it's basically really a complex system, which means that we need something like a million degrees of um, a million lines of code in our model systems to actually represent all of those components. And they're also interconnected in a non-trivial way, which means um, that often we don't really know how they're interconnected in, the, in, in terms of equations, but also um, it's very difficult, um, the timescales, for example, for the interactions, right? And finally, some of the processes are not very well understood. Um, so there are things here, benching in high community, very diversion, unpredictable. Suppose we have an observation data from approximately million formula, for example. Ha! <laughs> so um, Viewer is, is asking basically whether we can project our knowledge about the um, agents into the machine learning code. And this is, is a fantastic question that I'm not going to answer now. Um, but this is really, yeah, I'm going to come back to exactly this question later on. So on the other hand, um, I just said that everything is bad and we have this kind of horrible system. But on the other hand, we also have an enormous amount of observations, right? Um, I will tell you later that we have 800 billion observations coming into ESNWF every day from all sorts of different sources. And we also have a lot of climate simulations um, that we already have on tape that we can look into, right? So we have uh, like hundreds of petabytes of data of our, um, that are basically um, from the Earth system observations models. That, that are on site at ESNWF that we can potentially look into to understand the system. And if you now combine those two worlds, so predicting of weather and climate and the, the fact that we have hundreds of petabytes, um, you basically can understand that there are actually a lot of different application areas for machine learning, right? Because machine learning systems are exactly this. They, they learn nonlinear behavior and complex systems of data. So there are many application areas for machine learning in numerical weather predictions, and also um, machine learning provides a number of opportunities for high performance computing. So what will machine learning look like in 10 years from now um, from the perspective of numerical weather prediction? Uh, so I like to show this plot actually, um, this slide at the beginning of the talks. And um, this slide is showing you a scale where you have basically the, the point that machine learning will no long-term effect whatsoever in 10 years from now and it's just there's been a wave that is going to pass and business is back as usual in 10 years from now all the way to machine learning will um, replace conventional models altogether and we basically will do nothing else in machine learning in 10 years from now and there's kind of there are sub steps on this range um, where basically this is a, the steps on the left are kind of more obvious that machine learning is going to play a big role here in the future Whereas in the in the, the subsets on the, on the on the right, it's basically quite un, um, it's less obvious that machine learning will be um, be able to compete with conventional tools. So if you ask the expert and you ask around in the in the domain, some of the very senior people will tell you that you are going to be on the far left, and some of the very senior people are going to be tell you that you are going to be on the far right. So it's really this question is still open, and I can't give you a clear answer here. I can only tell you that the uncertainty range is still very, very large. So the answer to this question is basically we don't know yet and we are yet to figure out. What does this mean? Um, <clears throat> let's try to think of what would be happening if you go to the very right here. So what, what would be happening if you basically would try to replace the entire model um, by a machine learning application? So can we now replace a conventional weather system, a forecast system by deep learning? So in principle, you could base the entire model on neural networks and trash all conventional tools. And there may be good reasons to do this because as I said to you before, there are limitations for existing models and also we have this enormous amount of data. So let's try it out. Like what's going to happen if we do? Um, 
Let's start with a very simple test configuration. And this is a study that we performed um, like two years ago, where we basically retrieved um, so-called era five reanalysis data. So this data is basically um, representing the, the state of the atmosphere um, in the last couple of decades. And we just pick one field, which is geopotential height at 500 hectopascal. Um, and we kind of take this field, it's a two-dimensional field on the globe, and we just take it from in hourly distances. So we have kind of one hour, hour, the next hour, and so on and so forth. And we end up with something like 65,000 global data sets. And we now map this global data to a two-dimensional grid, which is cost resolution, like 60 times 31 grid points, um, something like 2,050, uh, 2,500 degrees of freedoms, not very complex at all. But now we basically try to learn a machine learning solution that will try to learn the update from one hour to the next. So really try to kind of understand how the field is progressing from one, one hour to the next. And we do this with a stencil that we kind of run through the grid and we always try to predict the, the point in the middle of the stencil. And we can do this with a neural network. Um, so we can just try to learn the update. And once you've learned the update from one hour to the next, you can actually run the system into the future and make a prediction. No physical understanding is required whatsoever. So that you do, really don't, know, and don't need to be, be domain scientists. So you can treat it as a, as a purely data science um, challenge. So let's um, figure out what's going to happen. You see two videos here, and I hope that they're coming out well in the virtual talk. I'm not quite sure. So one of them is basically showing the propagation of this um, field due potential height um, in the era five free none of this data set. And the other one is showing you the neural network solution. And what you see is that they are very, very similar. And even the domain scientist couldn't really tell you which one is which. And they basically show the same features, for example, westward propagating jet structures and so on and so forth. So actually, the neural network performed very well in terms of picking up the dynamics. So let's now make a prediction into the future and calculate a forecast error that we can do. So on the bottom right, you will now see an L1 forecast error for this field propagating in time for five days. And you will have in black the neural network. You will have in blue um, the cost resolution model. Uh, sorry, you, uh, in, in blue, there's a cost resolution model, which is like the resolution of a model that you would have worked with like something like 40 years ago. So it's very, very, very cost resolution. But it's kind of a good comparison because it will compare the neural network and the cost uh, and the dynamic model in a, in a kind of like, like with like um, type way. So basically, it's similar complexity. The operational forecast at Eastern WF is also um, plotted in here in the magenta line, so it's far away from um, the other two. So obviously, we're not expecting this model to kind of beat our conventional operational um, models. So this is very promising, right? The like with like comparison um, is doing well. And uh, if you just consider this to be um, um, some guy who has never worked with deep learning before, putting it into a data set and getting a result, this is really a positive result. So is this going to be the future? And I would have quite strong feelings by saying this is very unlikely. So there are several reasons for this. One of them is um, that the simulations are unstable. Um, so if I run my neural network forward, at one point it's going to diverge and it's not going to give you um, good results anymore. And the reason for this is are quite obvious because I haven't told it anything about things like conservation properties or stability. So that's a problem. Um, it's also kind of really unknown how to increase complexity in this setup. So you can basically um, build something like this for one field in two dimension, but it's, it's a different story to kind of increase this complexity to millions of degrees of freedoms here. And it's quite unclear how to do this yet. And also um, the amount of data is limited. So you only have something like 40 years of data that you can train from. Um, so even though you have um, petabytes of data, it doesn't mean that you're kind of looking into very different weather situation as such. So it's not only about the quantity of data, it's also about the quality. And there we only have something like 40 years with satellite observations. So if you wanted to train a, such a network just from observations, it's not going to work out well because you don't have too many. Um, so you, or you will definitely not be able to increase complexity very much because you only have a limited amount of data. However, having said all this, um, there are studies um, that are following up this, this study for, of ours, basically, and they're using much better networks um, and using more data, and they get stable structures and so on and so forth. So there's more to come. But I personally would um, say it's unlikely that those models are just going to, to, um, to beat conventional tools. However, having said this, it's also a question what you want to predict for. So if you want to predict the tender weather forecast, conservation properties are, for example, very important. If you want to do now casting, just looking one, one or two or three hours into the future, it's, it's, conservation doesn't really matter. And there are very promising um, examples here, for example, an example from Google, where they used machine learning tools for now casting applications. This is the precipitation and prediction over Seattle 
and you see the ground truth on the in the middle, the machine learning solution on the right, and the NOAA forecast, the current NOAA forecast on the left, and you will see um, that the machine learning solution is kind of much more similar to the observations. So if you talk about, for example, now casting applications, this is much more likely to actually be competitive. I think there have been a number of comments again. Um, da -da -dum. Only for the other, how could we define the good? Ha, that's a good question. So uh, the question is, um, if we only have 40 years of data, how can we actually define good length of data? Um, this comes to some extent back to this overfitting. So what you typically do is you take a data set, then you train a neural network, and you will pretty, pretty easily be able to figure out whether you're overfitting or not. Basically, you separate the training data set, the data set into a set where you're training from and a set where you kind of test your, your, your method. And if um, the neural network is performing very well on the training data set, but very poorly in the test data set, then you, you figure out that you basically have used um, a too complex network structure given the amount of data that you have. And that's what you typically do. So you can kind of adjust the complexity of the networks to the, um, to the amount of you have. And um, once you've done this, you will basically learn by trial and error test um, how, how much you can ask for given the amount of data that you have. OK, uh, so why is it actually so hard to beat conventional weather forecast systems? And I would um, phrase this very optimistically, which is basically um, that the models that we're working with are really, really great. So they, the models, we're talking about models that are running with billions of degrees of freedoms, um, finishing forecasts within one or two hours um, of, of just running from millions of observations. So it's not that we're starting from scratch here, right? We have um, models that are really, really complex. And this, the figures that you see here are um, figures of the top of the atmosphere cloud brightness temperature. And one of them is basically a satellite figure picture, and the other one is um, a picture from model simulation. And um, this is a very high-end model simulation, admittedly. So we have um, a global resolution of 1.45 kilometer, and you need the, the, the fastest supercomputer, or the second fastest by now um, in the world, um, to, to do such a simulation. However, you will see the feature richness, which is really amazing, right? I mean, even main scientists couldn't really tell you apart which one is now the model and which one is um, the, the satellite picture. So we're really talking about systems that are very complex. And again, um, to make the link to EasyWays, uh, EasyWays is kind of um, also focusing very much on those high-end simulations here. So this is actually um, um, a simulation that also kind of comes down of this EasyWays framework. So today, global weather simulations have billion, a billion of degrees of freedoms and can represent many details of the Earth system. And also, the Earth system is really based on decades of model development and process understanding. I'm running a bit short on time, I think, so I'm going to skip this slide. Um, basically, when I when I told you that the that our models are so great already, so what's the point in trying then with machine learning? Why why would you actually then apply machine learning to those different um, areas? Um, and here I want to make another point, which is basically the complexity of the workflow that we have in numerical weather predictions, right? So we start from um, gathering all the information together. Then we have a data simulation step where you basically combine observations and the model directory. And then you have, um, you, you generate initial conditions. And from those initial conditions, you run a forecast into the future using your forecast model and the big supercomputer. And then you get data out of this um, supercomputer that tells you something about the future, but this needs to be post-processed and disseminated to the user. And if you now think about where you could potentially work with um, machine learning in this framework, you will actually come up with a very long, long list of potential application areas. So I don't want to go into this detail here, but I'm just this is a list that we came up with at ECWF, and it's color coded. So the, the color of the text is kind of referring to the different boxes up here. And you will see that this list is very long and very complex. And it's kind of up to us now to really understand um, which of those application areas, for which of those application areas machine learning is going to make a big difference on for which of those areas machine learning is kind of not so important in the future. So I could run through the different, uh, first of all, and look for questions. Okay, nothing. Um, I could run, my aim was to kind of go through the different areas of application now, but I'm running, as I said, I'm running a bit short. I have 15 minutes left and I definitely want to leave um, time for questions. 
So I'm going to run through the next slides, um, probably skip a couple of them, for example, this one. Um, just, or, or maybe maybe I can give you just a rough overview about all the different slides. So I'm going to tell you now um, the different application areas that we're, we're following up at Eastern WF. And one of them is to look into observations and to detect, for example, rich, rich, um, risk of wildfires. So what you do here is you take observations and um, satellite observations and model data um, all over the world. And then you basically figure out with a satellite product where they have wildfires been in the past. And then you can learn basically to predict whether there's going to be wildfires um, based on the amount, based on the information you extract from those, um, those data sets. So this is kind of really a post-processing tool now, but it's based on observations as well. And um, this is a classical application for decision trees. Um, so this is kind of um, the, the second class of machine learning um, methods that I've shown you. Then you also can use um, data, uh, machine learning within data simulation. So data simulation is kind of combining the, the directory of the forecast model and the observations. So you will really learn to make it to, um, to have the, the model in the initial state, which is very much correlated to the state of the atmosphere given the observations. And this also will allow you to actually kind of understand what the model is doing wrong by a direct, with a direct comparison against the observations. So you can actually learn model errors um, by running the, the model inside the data simulation framework and to understand the differences to the observations. And by doing this, you can actually get two data sets. The input is basically the state of the model and the output is now um, the state of the, um, the, the, the error in comparison to observations. And once you've done this, you can actually learn what the model is doing wrong and you can try to bias correct. So you can really try to add a forcing term into the model that would correct for this error that you get. And this is research done mainly by Patrick and Massimo at Eastern WF, um, but you can really do this as well with very complex neural network structures. And this is something that we kind of now investigating in a collaboration with NVIDIA to really um, basically be able to, to take a given state of the atmosphere to understand what the model is doing as an error and then to, to, to correct for this error in simulations. And there are a couple of questions coming on. Is there any theoretical sense in thinking about multi-model ensembles, including both conventional GCMs and neural network models? Ha! Ah, you guys are you guys are asking very tough questions, which is good because this means that you're kind of following well. Um, it is so. Yes, it would be interesting, I believe, to kind of really combine conventional ensembles and neural network ensembles. In particular, if you think about forecast ranges very long, for example, season predictions. Um, so I think there is a lot of scope here. However, uh, if you, for example, think about the Eastern WF predictions that we have like 10 days into the future, for example, we typically don't do this a lot. We typically rather want to have um, a very consistent ensemble with 50 members that are all basically the same, for example, and there's a benefit in doing this. So it's a bit of a trade-off. I think, I think we will see more of this in the future, um, but also it's interesting to, um, to have basically um, a consistent ensemble, which just come from a, from a single source. And the second question is, is LSTM still good to use in weather predictions? Yes, it is. So an LSTM is basically a neural network structure, which is kind of picking up information from the past um, steps and kind of propagating it into the future, which means that it doesn't really only kind of go from input to output, but it also will um, take into account information from previous steps in an iterative um, neural network solution. And um, this has proven to be very efficient in a couple of application areas, and I think there's more to come. Yeah, LSTMs is really interesting. Numerical weather prediction forecast, I'm not going to talk about this slide because I'm running out of time and it's very technical, but it can also actually, the, the bottom line here is that you can also use um, machine learning tools to improve your, your forecast model as such. And then you go to post-processing, and this is a study that we performed um, together with um, Torsten Höfler from ETH where we basically kind of think about ensemble predictions. So we take the, also, the output of an ensemble prediction and try to improve the spread and the skill of those predictions as a three-dimensional solution of a machine learning um, task. Um, and we basically get, again, good results. So we see that if you have a five-member ensemble with a neural network prediction, you get actually better results um, than a 10-member ensemble without um, the post-processing for the specific um, score of, continu of that, we, that we trained for, which is a continuous rank probability score. So post-processing again, you basically have interesting application areas um, to look into. And then ECRAT, this is a decision tree um, that I've talked about before. So it's kind of a similar idea now. You take um, an ensemble forecast, you take a lot of observations that you have of them, and then you try to kind of uh, identify 
you correct the assembled spreads in comparison to the observations that you're talking about using decision trees. And this is actually a product which um, is developed by Tim and Fatima at Eastern WF. And this is already used in, in operational um, post-processing. So that's already kind of a, a tool which is in place. OK. Um, more questions and we kind of there's something like uh, if i'm if i'm right there's 10 minutes left so please shoot whatever questions you have at me and i'm going to try to kind of answer them because i think we should when we can stop at any time the, the more important thing is that that you guys um understand understand what i'm saying rather than to kind of get through the entire lecture so in some of your slides you present a chain when measure, measurements have a great impact better initial data um what are the chain chances to include a machine learning tool in that very ring of a clay chain to improve the quality of data so to inject good quality data in the whole chain atmosphere measures with drones um very good question again and yes it is very very interesting so um I will I will talk to you later about Eastern WF in general, and you will figure out there that only um, something like a tenth of the number of observations that come into the center are actually used within our prediction workflow, which means we have, there's a lot of pre-selections, for example, of observations. Um, here, machine learning tools could be very interesting, and also um, the, the the measurements that are taken from from satellites, for example, are not the same as the value that you would actually put into the the system. So. Um, uh, a temperature, like a frequency measurement of a satellite, for example, cannot be directly translated into a temperature at 800 hectopascal, which you would need for the model. To do this, we also use, for example, observation operators. And those operators, again, are kind of a very complex mapping technique. And you can, again, argue that we're already using machine learning. But you can even also argue that we, there's more to come here, that we will really um, kind of be more working with deep learning solutions, for example, in the future. So yes, absolutely. Um, just one point I wanted to make is that the atmosphere is kind of multi-scale. Um, so many of you have probably seen this plot before. Basically, it gives you um, 11 orders of magnitude time in terms of the scaling on the y-axis and um, a large number of uh, orders of magnitudes in, in space on the x-axis. And you have different phenomena that you kind of see here. And you basically go from the, the large scale features all, all over the globe, like ENSO or climate variability, to synoptic scales, to mesoscales, and things like microscales. And, the question is um, always in, in forecasting how you can represent those scale interactions well in your system. And um, be, because basically you have to represent all of those scales somehow, otherwise you will miss something. And how can you kind of combine something like this with a machine learning solution? And um, the machine learners um, among you will basically will know this, this kind of setup, which is what we call an encoder-decoder network structure. So what, what's happening here is you have an input state and then you um, go to the deeper layer and another layer and another layer, but you decrease the amount of degrees of freedoms that you have per layer. And that's kind of called encoding. Then you end up with something which is very limited in terms of the degrees of freedoms. And then you kind of increase the structures again to go to a high resolution output. And the, the reason for doing this is really kind of to, to, um, to focus on the important bits, to be able to focus on the important bits of the, and that you want to kind of predict. But you can also argue that this is very similar to a scale um, st stepping from fine scale to coarser scale and, and then up again to finer scale. So you can basically have ideas how to encode um, propagation, like um, scale interactions within your neural network structure that you're working with. And you can then also kind of introduce cross cuts from inputs to outputs directly to really make sure that you're not using any, losing any high resolution simulations. So the question whether you can use encoder decoder networks, for example, to represent scale interactions and um, there are a number of studies now using such networks, and you can not only do it in space and time, uh, but you can also do it in time. So basically, yes, um, th this is very interesting to look into, and um, we should really consider more of these kind of networks that are able to represent scale interactions as well. I'm not going to into detail here because of time. Then there are also questions um, that are rising, for example, um, how to represent unstructured grids in such an encoder decoder structure. So we will need to make more um, if you just want, if you don't want, always want to use kind of structured longitude latitude grids, but really the grids that are running within our model simulations. Um, yeah, what about high performance computing? Oh, I'll just, just check the questions once more. Um, are there already examples for use of neural networks and operational NWP models? Do not replace the whole model, presumably, but. Um, so yes, just for example, the example with the um, with the easy point post processing. This is already done in operations. We also have um, one example where you basically um, 
identify how to use um, SMOS satellite observations within the model. So basically, an observation uh, um, op operator, which is done basically by um, by neural networks already. So they are coming, but they're coming slowly because basically, as I said, it's quite difficult really um, to touch such a running system. High performance computing. As I said before, I don't think we should separate um, machine learning from high performance computing because they are very much interlinked. Um, so the the point that I want to make with a plot on the left is really um, that if you go and increase resolution, you are able um, from the bottom to the top, you are able to represent more and more features of the atmosphere that are kind of outlined here on the diagonal. And on the in the bottom, you basically see the the performance of the supercomputer that we were working with at the time. Um, when we were working at a specific resolution level, and you will see that this obviously increased um, significantly over time. So the bottom line of this plot is basically, as you increase computing power, you will be able to increase resolution, and therefore you will be able to represent more and more features of the system, and hopefully you will be able to increase your forecast. So there is a notion of high performance computing is important um, for numerical weather prediction. And however, there are at the moment a lot of challenges um, coming up about the use of high performance computing, which makes it kind of more and more complicated for us to kind of um, easily scale our models onto very complex um, high performance computing systems. One of them is um, that there will be more individual processes um, that we need to kind of keep busy. One of them is that we have more heterogeneous hardware that we need to be able to kind of port models to. Um, one of them is that machine learning has now a very strong impact on the developments in high performance computing um, and mainly towards very high flop rates, but very low numerical precision. And this is not exactly what our models are, are made for. So we will also need to learn how to use those machine learning tools. And the other one is IO. Um, I'm sure all of those topics are actually covered well within the summer school. So I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm just going to give you two, briefly two examples, um, how, what this means for the application of machine learning. One of them is to emulate schemes. So the idea here is basically um, that you, you run a forecast model and you store input and output pa pairs of, of a specific scheme, for example, the radiation in this case. And then um, you use this data to train a neural network to do exactly what the radiation team and scheme inside your model did before. And then once you've built a, um, a very good emulator for the scheme, you can actually replace the radiation scheme within your forecast model. And we've done this uh, together with NVIDIA and get quite good results. Um, they're not neutral yet, but in principle, the idea why you, this could be useful for your prediction system is um, that the new networks are going to be uh, very likely to be much more efficient than the original scheme. And also, um, this, the solutions will be portable to other hardware. So while it's actually quite difficult to port the radiation scheme as it to a GPU, once you would be able to uh, kind of represent it as a neural network, it would come for free. So um, again, this is not work that we haven't been the first year and not, we are not the last to look into this. So there's um, a very active area of research, but this kind of emulation process is really interesting um, in terms of um, combining the benefits from machine learning with high performance computing. I'll skip this one as well. And the other one is basically uh, how to learn how to use um, machine learning accelerators for conventional tools. So this is an example of the so-called tender course accelerator from NVIDIA, where you basically can are able to increase your um, peak performance by a factor of 16 if you're able to work with this kind of very specific half accelerator. However, you wouldn't need to be able to basically um, use half precision, which is very, very low precision for the numerical simulations. And also you would need to be able to um, represent everything in terms of a matrix multiplication, matrix, matrix multiplication. And we've done a paper here where we basically kind of have ported the the most expensive component of our forecast system, which is a transform, and in particular the drone transformation to this hardware. And we see quite good results in terms of, um, we can actually, we are able to reduce the precision without being um, being hit by an, a significant reduction of quality. And um, you can have a look at the paper if you want to get more information here. Any more questions? Um, nope. Okay. Um, so the challenges, this this one is important and probably I can probably stop after this slide as well. I'm just talking and then we can have another um, couple of questions if, if, if you have some. So there are still a lot of challenges for machine learning to kind of be applied for numerical weather predictions, in particular, if you go towards operations. Um, in principle, I hope it became clear that there's no fundamental reason not to use black boxes within weather and climate models. It's, it's okay, actually. But if you do, you should also kind of try to understand how in principle you can also project your knowledge about the earth system that you have into machine learning tools. So 
there was a question about um, if you know the Corollas force is there, how can you actually kind of introduce this into the architecture for the deep learning structure? And this is to some extent an open question. I mean, there are ways to to build hybrid systems that are based on the conventional tools, but a correction, for example, there are ideas about how to kind of put more physical knowledge into the machine learning architecture, but it's still at the very beginning. So if you have good ideas here, um, now is the time to look into those questions, I guess. Um, can we diagnose physical knowledge from the machine learning tool? So can we actually understand what the tool was doing? Um, can we kind of maybe bring some light into this black box and really understand um, how it's, it's um, how sensitive it is in, in certain parameters, for example? To this will be important to convince domain scientists, for example, that those are really fit for operational use because if they don't trust the tools, they're not going to like them. Can we remove um, fundamental errors in the neural network, for example, biases or also secure conservation laws? Um, can we guarantee reproducibility? So if you change the data set, for example, it may well be that the new tra a tool trained from this data set is performing much worse at the moment than the original scheme, um, and we can't allow something like this to happen in the operations. Can we find optimal hybrid parameters? So how to actually build the perfect hard network architecture for a specific problem is an interesting question. Um, we need to learn how to scale machine learning tools to really complex high performance computing applications. Um, we need to interface machine learning tools with conventional tools, which is surprisingly complicated actually. Um, we need to design very customized training data sets for um, our specific needs, which is non-trivial. <clears throat> in particular, for example, um, regarding the, the the time resolution that you often have in data sets is often not sufficient for the training of machine learning tools that are then going to be used within the data uh, within the the weather forecast system can we explore the full phase space and um, this means if you train something for nowadays climate how can you make sure that it's also going to work in future climate because typically those neural networks are very very poor in extrapolation so you can only really learn what's in the data and if something is outside of the data because the system has changed those new networks are typically not very good at this, and we, um, we need to make sure that this is not a problem. So those questions are there, and um, some of them are, uh, uh, many scientists are looking into those questions as we speak, and for some of them, there have been some approaches to answer them, but there's still more work to be done. So I can only encourage you to kind of think about those questions and to get them towards solving some of those questions. I'm going to skip this one um, because we're running out of time. There's some room for interactions if you want to work together with us at Eastern WF or kind of get into closer contact. One of them is that there's going to be um, a workshop in October about machine learning for Earth system observations and predictions, which is going to be um, virtual as well. So you would, are very welcome to, to join in here um, and listen to the talks. We're going to, we have a very special seminar series for machine learning as well. Um, one with one talk per month, where you basically talk about machine learning applications in the weather and climate um, domain. Um, Eastern WF is developing the so-called European Weather Clouds, um, which I believe is going to be very interesting um, for like the training of machine learning um, solutions in the future. So um, there's more to come here as well. Um, we have heard a couple of weeks ago that our Maelstrom EuroHPC proposal was successful, which basically means that I'm now coordinating a big European project on the use of machine learning in weather and climate applications. And um, with this, I'm sure they're going to be open position very soon, um, both at East WF, but also um, uh, among our partners um, in Europe. So please let me know if you're interested here. And I think that's it. So we're coming to the conclusion and I'm not going to read those um, points out because I think you can do this yourself. And I'm going, I'm very happy to answer any questions. And as I hear it's, it always makes like ping, Ping, which means that there are new questions around. Perfect. Um, so do you think it is possible to use AI to identify new oscillation patterns in the atmosphere? Uh, again, a very interesting question. So um, I think, yes, it is. So you can argue to some extent, I mean, there have been, if you, in climate science, people are often doing EUF analysis, for example, and then doing teleconnections to understand connectivity between different modes of the atmosphere. And you can argue that this is already, um, to some extent, machine learning, and there's more to come. In particular, it's also interesting um, that there is uh, a lot of work going on on causality. So to understand basically transitions between different regimes as well, using machine learning tools. So there's, um, um, there's also a lot happening here where you can do more and where you can have well, where we, I'm sure we will also learn more about, uh, we'll see more and more, um, more and more application areas in the future. 
did you think uh, um, for injecting previous knowledge, maybe Bayesian models can be considered? Do you know if there are some works on this? Um, I would recommend there's a um, there's a a nature review article by Markus Reichstein, who is kind of talking about exactly basically um, physics informed um, machine learning that would be very interesting to look into, I guess. Um, there are, this is a very active area of research. I would argue that there are a lot of papers coming up by now um, about exactly the idea how to kind of inject knowledge into the systems. There's, um, there are groups in particular with parameterization uh, developments that are looking into questions. So I, if you write me an email, I can, I can send you a couple of references. Good reading material. The, the, the problem here is really that this, 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 um, this domain is, is moving so quickly that it's almost um, impossible to keep up to date with all the good reading materials and stuff like this. But I can try to, I can, I can probably give you a, a couple of um, examples for online tutorials. Again, if you send me an email, I can, I'm happy to, to send you something back. I haven't tried many of those, I have to admit. Um, but there, there, there is a lot that you can basically um, look into. Uh, write me an email, I can, I can send you something. Um, please post the link to the summer school in the chat. Um, I guess you're referring to the to the conf, to to the um, to the machine learning um, workshop, and I think maybe if, if if Hilda is still in the in the participants, maybe she can post the link. Um, would be interested to hear about your application of machine learning gravity wave track. And saw the slide briefly before you skipped it over. E yes. Um, so again. Write me an email and I can send you more information. Basically, what we've done here is we 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 again took the the parameterization scheme of gravity wave track, and then um, we try to emulate it using neural networks and machine learning. What we saw um, and this is work mainly done by by Matthew Chantry in Oxford and um, in a collaboration with with between Oxford and and DCWF. And what we saw is basically that you can actually represent the gravity wave track, the non orographic gravity wave track, very well. Um, and you actually can also really tune the complexity of network to the accuracy that you want to look into. However, um, we saw kind of problems for the orographic wave track, which wasn't so easy to, to represent. Um, but I can, we can discuss by email again. I think that's more useful than discussing everything here. Is, uh, the slides, I, I'm pretty sure they will be um, published on the, on the web page. I haven't sent them to Julian yet, but I'm, I will do um, so. And then they should be available on the web page of the summer school, I believe. Yes, uh, again, you can get them slides. Gravity wave recommendations in particular in seeded generation is still not well represented in many models. Yes, that's true. Um, so we haven't done this. And we have thought about how to improve gravity wave track parameterization um, from observations, but it's a tricky thing to do because also the parameterization is very much depending on the resolution of the model that you're working with because you get a different representation of topography. But um, potentially it's doable, but we haven't um, we haven't started this. We really have started just to um, to try to represent what's there already in terms of the scheme that's implemented in, Eastern, in IFS at Eastern WF, because this would basically allow us to kind of first learn how to walk if you want before learn how to run, because it's more much more difficult to actually learn from observations, right? Um, yes, I will make my slides available for downloads. Um, so it was a pleasure. I believe all slides will be available on the page. Really. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, do you think that to overcome non-stationary can so, some problems be formulated as reinforcement learning problems? You guys are asking tough questions. Um, the answer from me, my side is I don't know, and this would be a, a very, very, very interesting research um, topic to look into, I guess. So I, I can't possibly say that it's possible, but it sounds like an interesting problem. And I'm going to now go briefly on the SNWF web page because someone asked for the link to the um, to our workshop that I'm going to present. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening. It was a, a pleasure. And I think we will see each other back in something like 20 minutes after the virtual coffee break.